Aloha everyone, this is Barbara McLean with Lecture 3.1, which is titled Spreading the Good News. This lecture will cover some general concepts about the period 1850 to 1930. We are all aware of uh, music education's vulnerability in the curriculum today, but I hope you found it interesting that the same problem existed in the mid to late 1800s as schools began to introduce vocal and then later instrumental music as curricular subjects. This was a period of experimenting with music education and it wasn't always successful. Sometimes music programs developed problems and were eliminated. Sometimes they weren't even started at all. As your text explains, this was caused by a variety of problems, including budgetary concerns, a lack of competent teachers, or doubt about its value. Sound familiar? Vocal music programs in the late 1800s uh, continued to grow in spite of these difficulties. And vocal music eventually became a required subject in most elementary and grammar schools, although much of it was still taught by classroom teachers, not by music specialists. This growth in vocal music was uh, due to several sociological factors. The first discussed by your authors was the scientific movement of the late 1800s. By 1880, there was concern that music was more entertainment than anything else. The pragmatic philosophy prevalent at the time created school administrators who desired subjects that were more scientifically organized. This led the music profession and music teachers specifically to begin to develop curriculum that was more knowledge based than performance based. That included sight reading, frequent testing, and recitations. In order to satisfy this need for a scientific curriculum, the profession also needed materials that went beyond songbooks and note reading methods. This led for a new category of teacher called the music supervisor, a specialist in music who could visit the schools and check on the progress of the students and provide additional music um, training for the less trained classroom teachers. Another great debate surfaced with the development of these materials concerning a philosophy of pedagogy. Some educators and publishers were advocating using a note reading approach, similar to our current methods of beginning piano or um, beginning band, while others believed in a rote approach, having the students first experience songs and singing games without actually trying to read the music. Which approach do you think won the debate? Hmm, <laughs> actually, it's still going on. <laughs> But part of the reason for this debate stemmed from the new progressive education movement influenced by Rousseau, Pestalozzi, John Dewey, and many others, which was gaining popularity in the early part of the 1900s. Because of the progressive education movement, educational research became more widespread and accepted as psychologists and educators attempted to establish stages of child development and then use this knowledge to alter the education system, including music, which it eventually did. One of the first signs of this change was the introduction of the kindergarten to our public schools in 1873. Music in high schools was the last thing to be developed, primarily because there just weren't very many high schools in the U.S. until well after the Civil War. For instance, in 1860, only 300 high schools existed in the entire U.S., and those were mostly in the uh, big cities of the North. In the late 1800s, less than 4% of all high school age students attended high school. High schools at that time were comprehensive and music was often included as a required subject. Um, initially in our high schools there were no electives. Every student took exactly the same classes and the same exams. High school music courses were, were uh, pretty much vocal and uh, uh, the vocal groups included singing uh, the choral works of European masters and a lot of opera things. 
Uh, this task was made easier by the fact that uh, most of these students had already learned to sing and read music while they were in elementary school. Following the Civil War, town bands became a popular uh, attraction. And you need to remember that live music was the only resource for culture since the radio was not yet in production. Performances by like touring bands and orchestras became really important in fostering the musical culture in the U.S. Let's listen to what the Sousa band actually sounded like with Sousa conducting. in turn inspired schools to expand their primarily vocal curriculum to include at least an extracurricular instrumental ensemble. The first school orchestra, by the way, was organized in Indiana in uh, roughly 1898 to 1900 by Will Earhart. Now, I'm telling you this because this is only 30 miles from where I grew up in Rushville, Indiana. In order to play in a school orchestra or band, students learned to play their instruments at home. They studied privately. Then they brought their skills to the ensemble rehearsal to prepare music for performances and work on performance issues for the whole group. This information is particularly important for our instrumental teachers for you to remember. When bands and orchestras were first introduced into the school curriculum, music teachers were not expected to teach students how to play the instruments during school rehearsals. The students had to go elsewhere for that or learn on their own. Eventually these extracurricular ensembles were added to the school's regular curriculum and given credit towards graduation. So keep in mind that the traditions that developed during the early part of the 1900s concerning our school bands and orchestras did that using an entirely different philosophy. Instrumental teachers today struggle constantly trying to maintain those performance traditions while simultaneously teaching students how to play their instruments. The reasons for this mini, uh, major change we'll, we'll try to discuss later in the class, but uh, I think this small piece of information should help those of you struggling to do this as you begin to realize how our bands and orchestras evolved and why programs which have more students studying privately are often considered better. Your textbook mentions lots of reasons that instrumental music sort of took off in our public schools. Uh, among them was the fact that we now had more schools. There was also an interesting movement going on in Great Britain uh, called the Maidstone Movement. It was a, an effort to create um, class instruction that uh, some of our American teachers really latched onto. We also had a problem. If we're going to try to teach instrumental music in large classes, we need textbooks. So teachers like Charles Farnsworth, Thaddeus Giddings, Joseph Matty, and Albert Mitchell all took on that task during this period. One of the first books uh, that was uh, developed for mixed instrument classes, that means heterogeneous, not all on the same instrument, was The Universal Teacher, written by Joseph Matty and Thaddeus Giddings in 1923. It was an important book because um, it made all of the instruments equal, whether they usually read melody or harmony parts. So imagine uh, a fantastic melody for the tuba. During this period, instrumental music in our schools grew by leaps and bounds. By the 1920s, instrumental music had become almost as important as vocal music in our public schools. Instrumental music grew for a variety of reasons, including the re, uh, returning musicians, uh, military musicians from World War I, 
and the increasing popularity of football, which led to marching band. Let's do a quick recap. First of all, the spread of music in our schools was not always easy or successful. The scientific movement that took place led to progressive education, which said, hey, are you just teaching for performances? We need more than that. So we had to invent a new position called the music supervisor to make sure that people out in our schools were actually teaching some music concepts of value. And a great debate began. Should we be teaching by rote or should we be teaching by note? Well, we need to answer a lot of questions, so we'd better do some research. We're going to use the scientific method to actually work in education. The spread of music in our high schools came last, mostly because we didn't have very many high schools. And everybody took the same classes, making it hard to get it into the schedule. Instrumental music became increasingly popular in our schools because of several factors. As instrumental music became popular, we needed materials for group instruction. <laughs> 